very excited that we're starting. It's been uh, a very interesting journey to put up the, the symposium and uh, we're gonna talk about the theme a little bit more. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to thank the, the team of the Fourth Arctic Art Forum. Um, it's a very fruitful and interesting collaboration and uh, we always wanted to, to work with Kristina Dragin and Ekaterina Sharova. And finally, we're having this, this chance and um, the symposium is a part of, I think, a very important event that has been happening in the North of Russia for the past four years and has mapped very interesting um, artistic processes that are happening in the Russian north um, and um, north of Norway um, um, and in Finland and Sweden. Um, when we were thinking about um, the theme of the symposium, I think we were, um, Annie and I, we were uh, trying to grasp most immediate processes that are happening at the moment that are also enforced on us um, um, by the pandemic, but are also, um, you know, have been um, stimulated by the pandemic, has been strength strengthened by the pandemic, and uh, has been also revealed by the uh, global uh, crisis that we are all experiencing uh, at the moment. Um, I think one of the um, very obvious things that uh, the pandemic has revealed is how much we all are uh, dependent on each other and how many processes that we take for granted are interconnected and related. And, um, um, and also related to our joint future um, that we also should perceive as a joint shared um, a future as something that's coming and gonna um, touch upon of all of us. So I think the question of the future has again become very urgent. Um, somehow a future has turned into something that um, had been supposed to um, kind of uh, prolong the present and, you know, future had been cancelled, but the pandemic, uh, on one hand, I think, uh, brought the question about the future back. What What is future? Is there a future? Or is there a lack of future? Um, and how altogether we can um, um, prolong the future, because the um, maybe absence of a clear idea of the future is also becoming um, a very serious uh, situation, context that we have to deal with. Um, what I can add is, um, I guess, this conversation and this symposium which we composed and landed on the Arctic Art Forum is very much about um, another conversation about the planetary conditions, but also it's um, it's a search for uh, new language, um, visual, academic, uh, uh, um, sociological language, uh, in order to. And, uh, what is this? It's kind of something. What is this? Kind of weird inclusion. So this uh, this language is the need for this language in uh, every discipline is very much important to find or to articulate in order to um, uh, find the way uh, that would lead to cognitive changes about the um, uh, way of how we exist. And I guess um, uh, the composition of different uh, different presentations that we uh, put together within the framework of the same uh, of, of the symposium is uh, somehow another way another step forward towards this um, uh, the search for, for new language that will help us to articulate new moral framework and um, uh, I guess that um, I don't know, I was thinking a lot about that kind of like all, uh, all this um, um, studies and research that somehow help us to understand this uh, condition in which we exist. And um, um, we kind of like, um, we try as uh, curators, as cultural workers to contribute to that, uh, to that discourse. And I hope this symposium will, will give us a possibility to at least find some clues uh, for, uh, to rethink the way how we exist. But also for us, it's very important to build up some sort of a, a public uh, platform where we can uh, uh, bring the knowledge and new thoughts and new perspectives 
steps into the public spotlight. So for us, it's very important to uh, put together as many voices from as many disciplines as possible to make to to convey our message um, uh, and to make it stronger in a way. So and to uh, uh, send it um, uh, out there. Um, so. The, the structure of the symposium is somehow divided into four strands, four research strands. And today, uh -huh. we have, it's possible. Uh -huh. Today we have um, uh, today we have a first panel, and um, it's um, supposed to give us understanding of um, uh, conditions uh, of um, a very important region in the in the Earth. It's Arctic region. And, uh, but you know, thinking about these planetary conditions, it's, um, for us, it was very important to narrow down the discourse to at least like one geography and uh, to articulate the particularities um, and uh, history and also uh, current state of, um, of um, Arctic region and high north. And also from looking at the, this region, we can also project to other geographies and go from the local conditions to, towards um, um, analysis to more global, uh, global processes that are happening uh, right now. Right, because we're going to talk a lot about um, a periphery of capitalism. We're going to talk a lot about hidden historic narratives. We're going to be talking about country histories and way to articulate this country history. And of course, when we talk a lot of, of all about these issues, we also understand that they um, are applicable to other places. And um, there are also uh, voices that are underrepresented that not only in the north, but also in the south and in other places. So how do we deal with this um, power structures and power relations that interfere in the process of uh, making some voices heard? And in a way, we, we hope that the symposium will also contribute to making some unheard voices stronger and replacing them um, at the uh, not only Nordic and Northern map, but also international map. Um, and I also wanted to say that in order to make our con conversation maybe um, more um, kind of embracing different spheres of knowledge, we've invited not only curators, um, but um, also artists and journalists, uh, researchers, um, people who uh, work a lot with environmental issues, just to give um, uh, maybe a wider scope on uh, the issues that we're going to be dealing with during the symposium. So I think we can jump um, to the first panel um, and, and start um, presenting our speakers. Anna, do you, would you like to introduce Martina Tlastanova? Yes, sure. Uh, so the first uh, um, uh, uh, the first panel sounds like uh, we uh, during the first panel for us was very important to look at the conditions to sort of uh, articulate uh, uh, to build up um, a framework and bigger bigger picture in a way uh, about the um, the region which we're going to talk about and also to connect it with uh, existing studies and theories and I think uh, um, uh, Madina is a person that uh, will help us to to go through um, to look at the um, um, uh, uh, to look to look at the, the uh, through the lens of um, uh, decolonial uh, post-colonial uh, feminism to look at the uh, uh, at the region, but also maybe touch upon like some post-Soviet conditions, maybe some uh, uh, some processes, structural processes that are, are happening in the uh, within the um, uh, within the planet, but also maybe uh, narrow it down towards uh, particular territory. So Medina's uh, Medina's. Uh, um, uh, uh, talk uh, sounds uh, uh, title for Medina's talk sounds uh, like the planetary crisis and ways to uh, refuturing in the northeast of the Anthropocene. And uh, Medina is um, uh, we 
really happy that uh, you agreed to uh, contribute to our the symposium. It's been a long way, uh, long wanted uh, collaboration. We've been following your studies and research and uh, presentations and writing for quite some time. And uh, we're really happy that you are um, with us today. Madine is a professor of postcolonial feminism in the, uh, at the Department of Thematic Studies, or Gender Studies, in Lipköping University in Sweden. And in her research, she focuses on decoloniality, the lens of feminism, uh, and uh, the global south, indigenous uh, cosmologists, stability, and uh, looking through all of these processes through the field of arts, design, philosophy, and um, social science, I guess. So, Madina, the floor is yours. We're really happy that you're here, and uh, we're really excited about your presentation. Thank you very much, Anna, Maria. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's my honor. I don't know if I can live up to your expectations <laughs> and uh, answer all the questions uh, and uh, touch upon all the things that you mentioned, but I will, I will try and then we'll see what happens. So um, usually I'm the one who stresses the importance of positionality in thinking and acting uh, what we call the geopolitics and corporate politics of being, of sensing and thinking, uh, the importance of this positionality uh, and also the critique from this positionality of the modern colonial discourse uh, that pretends to be universal, uh, yet at the same time hides its provincial Euromodern nature. Uh, but today uh, I would risk maybe to start from a larger scale and for a moment, imagine a possibility of thinking humans as an incredibly diverse, yet still interlinked collective that can use the pronoun we in the sense of human species and fellow terrestrials to quote Latour, recent formulation. Uh, so, so other species and forms of life on the planet are also included then. And of course, I, I'm aware of the fact that this we is very tentative and very problematic, uh, but I feel that today we cannot think the present or think the future uh, without having this scale in mind. Today, it's high time we started thinking relationally uh, rather than continue just thinking analytically. Uh, and of course, again, I'm aware of the fact that it's easier said than done because the whole modern colonial epistemic system and educational system also uh, have moved in an, in an opposite direction of narrow disciplines, applied problems, instrumental knowledge, answering the question of how and not what or why. There are many different ways to interpret the situation in which we collectively find ourselves today. Some of them continue to assume that a return to normality and the continuation of the modern colonial, political, economic, social and racial state, status quo are still possible. These are actually the people who are exclusionary and selective in their understanding of this we and dismiss the majority of the world's population, human and other population as falling out of modernity, falling out of progress, development and hence having no future. Uh, the leading mood has remained that of the um, chronophobic status quo, refusing to face the unsustainability of the current dominant uh, condition, which, uh, as you probably know, Donna Haraway uh, called a capitello scene. So it's a lifestyle with its endless race for growth, for progress, for the sake of consuming more and more. Uh, the negative phase of globalization coming to its apex today threatens to fold the world into a digital slavery mode uh, where coloniality would finally stop to be seen as a problem of only migrants, refugees, colonized people, indigenous people, or just a fashionable term of the academic elite uh, because uh, it will be a direct confrontation with each and every person living on earth and not only people actually. Uh, there are also other people or other groups who realize the complexity of the problems that the world faces today 
and offer to solve them with the means that are products of this very modern colonial world system that we inhabit. Uh, it can be failed political institutions and ideologies. It can be also failed technological euphoria that is often presented as a way of salvation, whereas we know that in reality, technologies are the key agents in altering human ontology, and the disease is mistakenly prescribed as the cure. Uh, there are also, of course, those who mistakenly, I would say, prescribe romantic antiquarianism of the good old past days and communities. Uh, that sounds wonderful, but is impossible to implement. Uh, but no matter how we interpret this crisis, we have to agree that human species finds itself in the midst of an unprecedented planetary catastrophe that has more visible, fast representations, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, and also the slower, but no less devastating and potentially defuturing elements, such as the climate change that is associated with extreme weather events, catastrophes, loss of biodiversity, natural resource stress, geopolitical fragmentation, uh, of course, expressed through wars and armed conflicts. Uh, and in that sense, COVID uh, is equally invisible and inconspicuous as the climate change, but it acts faster and lacks a clear teleology. And that is something that uh, is con connects them, of, of course. It's very hard to blame someone concrete and specific for this disaster. Yet the uncertain but rather distant future of the planetary catastrophe uh, has suddenly been brought very close to us all, putting the humanity into the conditions of fast and grim realization of futurelessness, lack of the future. Uh, for me, unsettlement is a very fitting concept to describe this current human condition, unsettlement. Uh, it has multiple interpretations connecting the material level of the imminent global movement of cities, people, businesses in the coming decades uh, due to the climate change, due to unsustainable economies, geopolitical wars and conflict, conflicts. But also, even more importantly, uh, unsettlement means also an existential crisis, existential effects of this resettlement of peoples, leaving them or maybe us with no sense of the future. Unsettlement recognizes an ending without any clear sense of what is beginning. So it's a, it's a perfect in-betweenness. It carries a feeling of foreboding that what will arrive will be unwelcome. As such, life is lived in this ever-expanding conditions of uncertainty, and the past then acts as a memory occupied by pain, by loss of all that was experienced and treasured. And the present is lived as a non-life. And the future then is merely, uh, is nothing. It's a void filled with a daily mix of faint hope and despair. A very green picture, right? Unsettlement has turned into a late motif of life and crisis uh, for many people. Uh, manifested on the ontological, existential, affective and material levels and massive migration is only one most obvious sign of this unsettlement. But there are also increasingly numerous precarious lives of those who seemingly stay in place and do not migrate anywhere, but their lives become more and more unsettled. Uh, again, COVID-19 crisis has enormously accelerated and intensified this tendency, leaving most of us feeling unsafe and unhomed in the most ordinary sense and previously secure situations in the family, in our homes, in the streets of our cities, among our friends. Uh, before this crisis, catastrophic capitalism has already renaturalized the war ethics uh, justifying our collective permanent loss of freedoms under the excuse of fighting the consequences of various catastrophes, natural, ge geopolitical, technological. And as a result, we have this normalization of the state of exception discussed by many scholars uh, and often induced by the dual state uh, that has already started turning every citizen into a potential threat needing to be monitored. Uh, and actually that again started much before COVID-19. 
These factors add to an escalating economic and social unsustainability, defunct politics with its failed institutions, failed nation states, international unions and bodies that have nothing to offer, except again, this permanent state of exception, competition for global natural resources and population displacements, triggering more conflicts and wars. And today this kind of coronavirus capitalism to follow Naomi Klein. Uh, the increased unsettlement includes uh, the post-democratic and post-peace contexts, uh, the commercialization of all spheres of life and its dispensability, uh, the fear to realize the movement of time, uh, that is what is called by chronophobia, uh, and uh, the, the, failure, the fear to realize the finiteness, the fragility of the kind of existence we've built for ourselves and other species, and as a result, inability to imagine a different world, and not only imagine, but also start working for its implementation. Uh, it's largely, I think, a lacking understanding of interconnectedness of all aspects of the major crisis we inhabit, which is already altering, changing our nature as humans. And this is a very interesting topic to discuss. Uh, it's a fitful grasping of isolated elements of being by our inept, derelational kind of cognition thinking without being able to relate them dynamically and pluriversally, as we say, in the colonial option. In the colonial terms, pluriversality terms and means maintaining a coexistence and correlation of many different uh, interacting and intersecting positions with equal rights to existence. As a concept is linked with pluralism, of course, uh, that recognizes multiple perspectives displacing the notion of one or homogenous world. The situation with climate or water refugees is a bit different from the more familiar geopolitical and clearly military conflicts and as causes of mass migration uh, that we remember from the recent past. This is uh, different because it's a geopolitics of mere survival. The grim reality of forever barren territories useless for habitation, uh, agriculture, vast and previously densely populated plains that are flooded by the rising ocean, has no use for political uh, casuistic, let's say, to define the degree of democracy in different regimes. Uh, instead, it magnifies the situation of survival as such, unconnected to political preferences, at least in any straightforward way. Uh, this kind of unsettlement downsizes, I would say, and humbles the humanity to its more realistic dimension and accentuates both the new forms of inequality and the new ways to solidarity, which are very difficult to implement. A combination of these and other factors that I've just very, very briefly sketched has received a trendy name of the Anthropocene, understood mostly as an emergent time after the present geological time, the Holocene, as a designation of the influences of the anthropocentric actions and transforming climatic, ecological, and environmental systems and, and futures. The concept is highly contested, as you know, and criticized from many positions and mainly from its uh, Euromodern and paradoxically anthropocentric myopia, I would say. Uh, but in any case, unsettlement, I think, is what it has to offer humans and other species as a current shared pluriversal condition marked by the futuring. We experience it differently depending on our trajectories, privileges, disadvantages, and in the context of the looming fragmentation of the human species that is evidently going to act as a ground uh, for a new uh, dehumanization, I would say, a new cycle of dehumanization. Uh, this brings us back to the modern colonial human taxonomy that has been in place for over 500 years now and has not essentially changed in its grading of human life with differential values. Uh, the human taxonomization process has now been extended to the human technology relation as seen in conflicting notions of the post-human. Uh, the horror of what is happening is that our species is now in the initial stages of fragmenting, as several scholars have pointed out. We are becoming a fractured species with a changing ontological nature, and such selection can so easily become decisive of who deserves to survive and which groups of inferior people can be sacrificed. So it's a new looming 
type of racism that's in the making. And this is a crucial aspect of today's crisis that the Anthropocene as a provincial elitist theory of the privileged global north does not even start to discuss or realize, therefore remaining mostly irrelevant and even, I would say, unethical in the global south, for example, or in places that don't fit both definitions. The present uh, complex crisis has a clear, if not the main ecological dimension uh, as one of the obvious global challenges, which is often described in universalist terms. Uh, and it's a big mistake because environmental challenges cannot have a universal language of description as they are perceived differently by different human collectives. All the fashionable discussions of sustainability, environmental justice are still largely grounded in the old modern colonial subject-object dichotomy of nature and humans, while desirable ecological models are still based on the preservation of nature for its continuous, rational, efficient exploitation by these very same humans. In this model, the Euromodern subject denies uh, he's belonging to nature slash animality, forgets that he's a technological anim animal and not the only technological animal for that matter, thus becoming derelational from the world and reinstating this objectification of nature as an object of externalized observation, of externalized study. Today's ecological crisis, it seems, is a result of precisely this modern epistemic deficiency that is grounded in ontological alterity, in taking ourselves out of the world and occupying this very strange delocalized vantage point in looking at the world and cognizing the world in this ontologically ruptured way. Hence, the fatal human loss of proportionate need and consumption, uh, which I think is a very important indicator, a measure that one finds not only in the majority of indigenous cosmologies that never consume more than necessary, uh, our economies, ethics, indigenous cosmologies, economies, and ethics, but also interesting in love, the same we find in, in other animals, I mean, other than humans. So it looks like as long as we keep the concept of nature as the other of humans, of culture or civilization, anthropocentrism will still continue to reign, even if in paradoxical forms of criticizing itself, as we see now. Even asking science to help, Western philosophy is unable to get out of this dead end. A decolonial approach is different. It could cancel the dichotomy of nature and culture as such and shift to a complex relationality and process-based view of our entanglements with the planet, with other lives, with inanimate matter. Uh, and in this sense, what is needed is a major rethinking of naturalized and massively imposed uh, concepts and ways of, of ways of let's say making sense of the world. Even we can say like that. Uh, finally, if we look beyond the dichotomies of the global north and global south, and pay attention to more complex and multi-layered situations of the poor north, for instance of inter-imperial intersections and entanglements where unsettlement has long been uh, normalized and even turned into a starting point for refuturing, we can try to get out of this binary black and white thinking that still persists in critical fear, including its environmental aspects. This shift would allow transcending academic thinking and go in the direction of agency and bottom-up activism, social, political, and artistic. Uh, it can generate transversal relational solidarity beyond the bankrupt institutions and power structures and focus on other ways of resistance, re-existence, the networks of resources for launching new communities of change which could help us start creating a new political imagination as a way to refuturing. This is still, of course, a very subjunctive modality of a new political imagination and agency. This does not mean that we need to try to restore the human-sized and human-centered world. Rather, I think it means that we should try to use our human abilities, including critical thinking and technologies, as well as relational practices grounded in realization of our unity with the world, for advancing the sense of responsibility and efforts to save the life on our planet in all its forms and cooperate rather than compete. That's very important. Cooperate rather than compete in order to survive. 
For that, we need to stop seeing ourselves as victims negotiating a better affirmative action or masters oblivious to anything outside of our lifespans uh, to become uh, nurturers of this re-existence, a redefinition and resignification of life in conditions of dignity, a praxis of the otherwise. And I'm quoting here uh, Catherine Walsh and Walter Mignola. Uh, and also as initiat initiators of deep coalitions, and this is Maria Lugones' term, uh, the colonial feminist Maria Lugones' term, um, that are grounded in solidarities, but they are never reducing the multiplicity uh, uh, um, spanning across the differences, never trying to erase the differences. It works with them and from them. Uh, this balancing act uh, is a strive to overcome the immobilizing locality of continental and national ontologies and the modern colonial predicament, the bleakness of the looming world of total surveillance, uh, but also inevitable self-limitations instead of thoughtless consumption and growth. Uh, the re-existing element in these emerging communities of change would have to be a collective and not an individual or individualistic endeavor, changing the mode of representation and visuality uh, and understanding of the self, uh, of the world, and the new political imagination to the future and to refuturing. These communities of change grounded of necessity in unsettlement would have to make it into a positive design, ontological design, I mean, for the fragile and unstable world and the humbled human being who would have to learn how to make this immense and boundless scarred and injured world into a communal home again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Medina. Uh, that was very uh, uh, complex description of the reality. You try to really grasp together the the really like planetary scope, and um, I think that's a, that's a good start for us to go like zoom in into like more details and uh, more particularities through the lens of uh, local cultures, uh, local traditions, uh, local knowledge, and I think it's. Um, Will be um, like will be a good shift uh, to to our next presentation uh, to Anna Salaviova, who will really bring us through the different way of um, uh, surviving local cultures in uh, uh, high north in Arctic region. Um, so through through her presentation, we will dive into uh, particularities of. Um, uh, of the region, and then uh, in the future discussion after that, we're gonna like combine these two presentation, and uh, we also will invite Nastya to uh, to to comment on uh, both of your presentation. Masha, do you want to introduce Anna? Um, I just wanted to add that, and Madina, thank you. It's it's almost a manifesto. Yeah, and they have. Um, <laughs> a few questions that I will ask later on. And for everyone who would like to, to ask some questions, please use our chat on YouTube. And if you want to ask some questions in Zoom, you can also um, type them here in our chat so that we wouldn't miss any comments or questions and what bring um, all of our audience into a discussion. Uh, Masha, do you want to introduce Anna? Yeah. Or Anna, what, what, uh, would you like to speak English or Russian? What would be better for you? Anna, we can't hear we you. We can't hear you. You have to turn on uh, sound. Okay, I will just introduce Anna while she's figuring out the, the technical uh, solution. So Anna Salaviova uh, is a doctor of philosophy and professor at the Department of World History at the Nordic Arctic Federal University in Arkhangelsk, where we were all supposed to be uh, had we not had Corona and Zoom. Um, and Anna studied history at Petrozavodsk State University and theory and history of culture at Russian Institute of Cultural Research um, in Moscow. 
And she also studied cultural anthropology and cultural studies at University of Minnesota and University of Pittsburgh. And her spheres of interest include culture and historical dynamics of the Northern Arctic sphere, uh, space um, images formation, interethnic and intercultural communication in the high north, culture and anthropological specifics uh, of the migration and mobility in the high north. And Anna will give us, I think, an kind of overlook of the Russian north at the global art stage, and she will talk about decolonizing uh, authenticity and um, we'll use the Nordic context, the, the Russian Nordic context as an example. So my theme is uh, Russian North at the global art stage and I will be talking more about the precise example of the uh, heritage crafts in the northern, uh, in the European north of Russia. And uh, uh, I take it as a case uh, that demonstrates the way how diverse cultural community historically participate in the construction of the Northern Russian culture. And before I start my presentation, I need to uh, explain that by the Northern Russian culture, I mean definitely the European North of Russia, because there's a lot of different understandings of the Russian North, uh, the one that includes the biggest part of uh, the Far East and then also the the Arctic North in the, in the Siberian area. Uh, that's uh, not the one that I imply. I imply the uh, historical uh, understanding of the Nash Russian, uh, Russian North as a European North of Russia. So it's an area which is closely connected, connected to the uh, Scandinavian countries and, uh, and Finland and uh, that is actively uh, understood from this point of view in the area where I live. So, um, okay, uh, I guess I still can't uh, demonstrate my PowerPoint, but um, well, another question which I would like to um, mention is uh, the way how uh, the uh, material objects of the Northern Russia use the, well, kind of demonstrate the uh, authenticity material or the idea of authenticity uh, to interface between the Russian uh, national and the global Western culture. And that's a historical discourse uh, that appeared in the 19th century and that in a way constructed the authenticity as the pure Russianness of the northern Russian area uh, that was opposed to the westernized elites of the 19th century Russia. So um, at the same time, uh, the heritage folk crafts combine different traditional techniques, different symbolic patterns and different natural materials uh, to reproduce locally embedded values and knowledge. Though uh, today the situation is really fragmented because uh, when the people are doing and uh, doing their art and trying to find their way in the global commercial context, they are using all sorts of different interpretations of the local symbols. Some of these interpretations uh, appeared in the imperial Russia and they are historically embedded in the beginning of the 20th century. Others were developed in the Soviet time and especially in the uh, 60s and 70s when the Russian North became uh, more understood as a cultural region or the region of folklore past or the region of antiques. And then some of them appeared in the 90s uh, of the 20th century when the regionalisms in Russia used a lot of different local symbolic features to develop political activization. Uh, though uh, the Russian North is more understood in the cultural terms than in the political terms, uh, mainly because of this tradition uh, of uh, um, interpretation of it as a heritage region that appeared in the 19th century. So uh, uh, as my slides are not shown... We're trying to figure it out. Sorry. Oh yeah, here, a, here they are. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so tell several words about the 19th century uh, context of the Russian uh, culture development. And it was in the second part of the 19th century that the Russian elites realized that the necessity to create their own national ideologies and national myths. And that's exactly in this context when they went to the uh, area of Northwestern Russia uh, to uh, collect different material objects and folklore traditions and to create from them something 
something which would look like uh, uh, the uh, typical great Russians national culture embedded in the uh, pre-Western time in, 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 the, in the areas and in, in the traditions before Peter the Great reforms that make, made Russian elites Western. So uh, it was uh, in this context uh, uh, that the Northern Russia became the frame for identifying the Russian culture in the Western context. And uh, now it includes the national symbols creation and also the international tourism and souvenir production, which still represents uh, the Northern Russian symbols and ideas at the international scene. So uh, also uh, the term the Russian North appeared in the late 19th century because before the area was called uh, Pomorye and then uh, the North of Russia and it had a lot of different other historical namings. And it's interesting that the, the term appeared as a result of the traveling of uh, the Arkhangelsk area gov governor Engelgard uh, through the area. He wrote the travel notes uh, in the form of richly uh, and published them in the form of richly illustrated book which was titled The Russian North. So as a result, this area became, first of all, um, understood from the point of view of traveling notes and some kind of exotic province, which is good to visit for the both for the Russian elites and for the tourists from abroad. And at the same time, it was the political leader and economical leader who introduced this term as part of the uh, <laughs> kind of PR project for his province. Also, there were several other processes in the uh, late 19th century Russia that um, showed, uh, that kind of um, constructed the authenticity of the Russian North as an authentic and uh, archaic region. So now my presentation is here. And uh, the slide shows different pictures that were produced in the 19th century Russia by the famous Russian artists like Ivan Bilibin and, and Vasily Verishagin, uh, who traveled in the North and also represented it at the international stage. So uh, to clarify this idea of heritage representation of the North. Uh, I uh, show you the quotation from Dmitry Lihachev, academic Dmitry Lihachev uh, story about the Russian North, where he establishes the idea of the cultural monument of this area, which is understood since the 19th century as a spiritually Russian and antique Russian region. So, uh, but if if we come uh, to the heritage folk crafts, and they are also very important to represent the uh, authenticity of the area because they are produced locally and they are creating uh, the uh, material part of the um, area representation. They are associated with the rural life and they respect traditions of the past. And of course, they're close to nature that uh, kind of creates the idea of their sustainability. And also the monetary value of the artifacts reflect the degree to which they, they are byproduct of different traditions and uh, the, the way how their aesthetics and designs reflect the whole culture and worldview of the community. So uh, that's why I uh, look at the heritage crafts, first of all, um, as a case for my study. Uh, in the uh, Imperial Russia before the um, revolution and also in the Soviet Union, the monetary value and export revenues uh, from the souvenirs that were created in the, uh, on, on the, with the motifs uh, of the local heritage crafts stimulated the creation of the new industrial infrastructures uh, that are called in Russian Kustarne Promysle and Narodne Promysle. First in Imperial Russia, they were created by a famous Russian industrialist uh, Mamontov and then later in the Soviet Union, different institutions participated in this process. So uh, this uh, authentic, so-called authentic uh, crafts uh, um, were created in, in the cooperation of professional designers and the local craftsmen uh, who together reinvented the, lo the local Northern Russian folk crafts in a hybrid form of the national souvenirs that are customary made first, first of all for the foreign public. Uh, and in the contemporary 
uh, situation, the global cultural market also exploits a lot of local exotics. So it is still commercially profitable uh, to replicate the design patterns of the Northern Russian folk crafts that are produced in the Soviet context. And here I have some pictures from the local enterprise, which was created uh, in the uh, 1967 in Arkhangelsk. It's called Belomorsky Ozore. And it's uh, uh, the enterprise where the designers created the uh, patterns that were later industrially reproduced. Uh, and the patterns were based on the local fold crafts, uh, techniques, materials, and also the uh, ornamental patterns. So here in the picture, you can see three uh, objects that are now uh, are protected by the intellectual property law as the uh, patterns uh, for the um, local and heritage crafts made by designers and reproduced by designers uh, in, in this uh, local uh, factory. But also uh, in the 70s of the 19th century, uh, in the local areas began the Northern Russian folk craft reconstruction movement. A lot of people from the local community started to reproduce uh, the knowledge of uh, heritage crafts that they got from their uh, older people who are still new and still kind of remembered how to do the old craft um, from, from their childhood. So uh, also it influenced the choice of the content and the strategies for the educational program that taught so-called authentic ethnic cultures, authentic Russian culture uh, in the Arkhangelsk region and then in uh, Balagotsk region, in, in Kareli and in Murmansk. Uh, this movement uh, <laughs> is still really active. But if we look at the uh, ways of evaluation it, uh, there is a question of how authentic it is or is the authenticity of this uh, craft uh, historically emergent? It is not static, of course, and you cannot think about some kind of a particular museum object that it started from. Also, uh, today, the discourse of authenticity often arises in both the local residents and visitors' accounts of the experiences in the North. And then there are a lot of people who participate in that who, who are not uh, community members. And then also, uh, it's not um, today the real or original thing which is standing outside of cultural interpretation. So under the influence of experience economy, also the folk lifestyles of the communities and uh, uh, the crafts of the communities obtain a lot of different new meanings that are reflecting the uh, actual cultural trends. So here there are several cases that I would want just to uh, show to you. Well, uh, uh, the in the year of uh, 2018, uh, uh, the Walk Italia created the photo session in Arkhangelsk uh, region. And then the main idea was to show all the different uh, Russian style objects uh, on the background of the uh, heritage landscape in one of the villages in the Russian north. Uh, but the production of uh, this photo session uh, made a very deep uh, reaction on the local people living in the area. So they created the response with their photo flash mob where they showed that they are not so strangely looking and they are not so exotic as uh, Vogue showed to them. Uh, the case is quite interesting because it demonstrates that the uh, stylistic uh, experience and the, also the representation of the style of the Russian North can be uh, the story which is actively um, uh, kind of stressing the importance of local narratives and understandings of the way how local cultures look like. Also, uh, if we look at the fragmented and decentralized cultural context in the heritage crafts evaluation in the 21st century, we can trace several trends in it. Uh, first of all, uh, there is still a lot of qualitative selection of the authentic objects uh, that are integrated in, uh, in the historically established hierarchies of different classic genres, trends, and national art schools. Uh, like there, um, we have a lot of 
different statuses for the local craftsmen that are given to them uh, by uh, the organizations and institutions that developed in the Soviet time when the crafts were highly sponsored uh, by the state organizations. At the same time, uh, we have a lot of contemporary art um, projects that reflect the traditions as something which is multidimensional uh, and uh, uh, that places it into the landscapes and the folklore landscapes uh, that diminish the borders between the artists, designers, and local craftsmen, between the creative products that are represented in museums, in the galleries, and the processes that create them, between the authors and the audiences. And also the local communities use their craftsmanship today as the creative expression uh, of their identity stories. Uh, with the way how they can share their dreams about the future and cherish their heritage landscapes. So here are several examples. Well, first of all, uh, so the slide needs to be coming. Yeah, there are a lot of locally produced traditional crafts uh, that are trying to uh, apply the embedded knowledge, uh, for example, about the birch bark container making uh, to different artistic projects, but they're still working in the traditions of the craft that they got from their ancestors. And here are two examples. Alexander Shutihin is the uh, craftsman from Kotlas uh, who represents the very deep and very artistic knowledge of the birch bark as a material. Uh, also, uh, we have an interesting museum of uh, family, Shevelov family in Karkopol, who create Karkopolske toys, but also do a lot of different other crafts like birch bark containers where they put their locally produced honey. Then also, uh, there is another trend when the uh, landscape is used and the, and the folk community is used as the place of creative experiments. And here I can think about the wonderful experience of art residence and museum Marian Dom and Charcola village, uh, which is very um, in a very good relations with Arctic Art Institute. And then there are several projects made there. But what is important here is that they support the multiple cultural experience, both of the local communities and also of the artists. In a way, the trend could, could be called uh, the art of living in the contemporary Northern village uh, as, uh, as a way to understanding different old traditions and reinterpretation of the, uh, of the past traditions. So also uh, the pictures show uh, first uh, the Parata Baska project, which was curated by Yekaterina Sharova, uh, where the artists uh, try to understand the local traditions from the point of view of their uh, artistic imagination and also studying the deep roots of the ornaments and uh, the landscapes, but also the local communities reflected on it. And then also the Chakolo Museum opening uh, was quite an interesting project and the picture uh, by uh, Irina Yefimo that I also used to represent my speech shows uh, how the here is an object only uh, by the gesture of putting the sign that it is an art residence now. The, the thing of uh, um, the, the whole story of creation uh, and art object in the uh, community uh, should be studied more deeply, but I can do it now, of course. Then also uh, uh, there is uh, the story of fine crafts uh, that are produced like heritage crafts in a way. And I put here a question because uh, um, when the, um, old technologies and raw materials are becoming, uh, through the art of designers, part of the luxury culture uh, that is consumed for the um, elites and intellectual elites. There is a question of uh, how much heritage is in it and uh, how, uh, how, how, how it could be applied to the democratic and sustainable art of the local communities who for the most part, cannot afford having these objects. But anyway, this minimalist object uh, that are created using the uh, images of the um, uh, traditional crafts are uh, addressing some elitarian segment of the 
uh, fragile in a way because they are dependent on the uh, general trends in the artistic stage. And also some of these products are interesting to, as a concept that are showing how the Northern Russian heritage could be uh, de developed to the modern storytelling or uh, how the traditional everyday used objects of the past can uh, be created as a pure aesthetic meditation instruments for the contemporary elites and, and uh, for the artistic uh, surroundings. Then, uh, so here there are two objects which I uh, would like to show you. And first of all, this is quite well known Sohar uh, brand uh, by Dmitry Milovanov, who uses uh, the uh, traditions of uh, wood uh, techniques and uh, wood reproduction of the Russian North uh, to create his objects. And then also the uh, objects of um, Dmitry Belyaev that are called Pomors, and then they are now uh, shown at the uh, competition between the Russian designers that is held in the uh, Museum of Decorative Art in Moscow. Uh, also, uh, there is another thing which happens uh, in this fragmented uh, context of uh, reinterpretation of traditions when the ethnic ornament is taken away from the traditional objects and is added to some kind of uh, new materials uh, to create traditional and authentic appearance. So lo usually it's done with the local souvenirs. Uh, but what is interesting uh, is that the local souvenirs are used by the uh, community to tell their own identity stories and uh, that they know a lot about the local ornaments when they uh, buy or represent these souvenirs on the artistic stage. So here uh, there are several pictures that I'd like to show to you uh, with the recreation of the Northern Russian folk painting motifs. Uh, folk painting of the Northern Dwin is one of the richest heritage traditions that we had in the past uh, and that developed in the late 17th, 18th century and uh, widely and very deeply represented in different museums today. But uh, we can see how they used uh, for the souvenir production uh, when uh, the favorite motifs of the folk or paintings like birds and then different um, flowers are decorating the new objects. Like there is a series of uh, dolls made by Elena Pantina and uh, um, Anastasia Piskunova that are called birds and uh, they're shown at different art shows uh, with the artistic dolls. And then also there are a lot of souvenirs uh, that are representing the uh, wood painting for, at the new materials. And then also there are several other souvenir production stories that are uh, represented at, at the local stage. One of the famous brands is the Bronsky brand and Mikhail Bronsky is one of the artists who does the painting at, at, at all sorts of different new materials like fabrics and then paper. Uh, he produces also um, um, local tea packaged in the um, paper that is uh, handmade, that is decorated with the handmade painting. So uh, this is also one of the ways of uh, deconstructing the idea of uh, totality of interpretation um, of the heritage interpretation that was uh, developed in the late 19th century uh, and applying it to some kind of a new um, materials and uh, new formats of uh, representing the artistic objects of the Russian North. So as a result, I would like to state that the, the global cultural state today, something which is called authentic, uh, demonstrates a lot of hybrid features. And uh, the hybridity uh, means the ambivalence and the mimicry that appears in the space between the Northern local uh, understanding of the art and then the Russian national understanding of the art. And of course, the global and West or so-called Western cultures that are still uh, very much present uh, as tourists, as um, uh, artistic trends, uh, as uh, uh, souvenir consumers in the Russian North. Some of the references are given here and sorry for all the 
problems that I had with these presentations. Uh, I will, sh I guess, uh, you can look at my presentation later. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anna, thank you so much. So it's a um, kind of a uh, very challenging uh, task to connect uh, Medina's uh, uh, very um, um, kind of planetary picture at the, um, at the uh, reality and uh, very detailed and very, um, uh, a very local in a way um, story of um, Anna's presentations. But maybe we can, uh, we can uh, ask uh, Stasia Vyapriva now to comment, uh, being also from, uh, from uh, Arkhangelsk and uh, living um, in St. Petersburg, being an international artist. Uh, we're curious, what, uh, what is your take on the um, 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 what Anna explained in terms of this totality, appropriation of uh, local and indigenous culture, which is like we're talking about indigenous knowledge, local culture, but what is exactly behind it? Anna tried to really unpack now in, in her presentation. And um, uh, so, uh, Nastya, what would be your um, uh, thoughts and takes and uh, reflections? Okay, so it's a hard question uh, for me, but I tried to pin some key points. Uh, uh, I think it's quite important. So uh, as artists, uh, I can say about art uh, world, um, uh, because um, this is a part of all uh, globalistic process and uh, like example for other um, process also. Uh, uh, if you are uh, an artist from North and you uh, want to be um, kind of famous, so you should go to um, Western countries or to the capital of your country or uh, find uh, help uh, of uh, some institutions. Uh, uh, so you need to um, be a part of this uh, hierarchical uh, system, colonial system, uh, and uh, to uh, continue your career. So you, like um, a famous uh, uh, scientist Lomonosov, you should uh, leave your northern countries and go to the uh, capital, St. Petersburg, and um, there, uh, you, uh, like a part of other, uh, other artists, uh, you should understand uh, how, to, uh, how to be in this circle. So you, um, uh, the first way, uh, you can forget about your locality and uh, start uh, to be a part of uh, all uh, these global issues like capitalistic issues, uh, ecological issues, uh, social, political issues. Or um, you uh, should uh, remember your locality and use this locality like a, a capitalistic trend because uh, uh, it's um, your um, it's very uh, profitable to you to be from uh, some another interesting country. Uh, you can be more uh, more interesting among other artists. Um, so. Uh, it's uh, the second way. And this way is also has a two, um, two ways. Uh, so if you want to represent your locality during global, um, global scene, you can uh, uh, choose the easy way, uh, like um, um, it can, uh, can it's, it has a dangerous to be like a self parody of your locality. Like uh, you can imagine uh, some mysteries or uh, local uh, indigenous uh, knowledges uh, that uh, it's hard to translate. Uh, this is a problem. So this, uh, if you have a easy way or you choose a hard way uh, to try to connect uh, all your locality uh, knowledge uh, with uh, uh, all global issues. But uh, has, uh, you probably will have a problem of not 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 translatable. So the three key points I think uh, in this situation is like a self colonization or uh, the first one. The second is a Western or uh, Moscow or institutional admission, and uh, uh, the third one is a logistic of the knowledge. Uh, so. Um, 
this is a question who has the right to speak it's uh, quite uh, important uh, for 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 every time uh, who uh, if you use the uh, western knowledge or you use the local knowledge uh, what is the local knowledge uh, because uh, it's hard to understand uh, what is the local knowledge because uh, when we speak about indigenous um, indigenous people for example uh, it's easy to imagine how they look because we uh, uh, can imagine a picture of them and it's quite hard to listen to them so uh, it's uh, uh, important to uh, speak uh, from from this knowledge i mean um I think it's a crucial point <laughs> for all this situation. And uh, if you are a local artist, you should uh, hardly produce uh, your own knowledge. Uh, um, sorry, I lost, I lost, I lost my line. Um, are you? Do you feel, Nancy, that in in a way that if you're a local artist reproducing local context, you put yourself in a very tight fr framework as an artist? Or why, why, why um, or like a certain category that you want to avoid to be put into? Why, why can you develop this argument maybe? Okay, I mean that uh, we have a lot of examples of, uh, uh, for example, art of uh, indigenous people. Uh, but uh, we have not so much examples of a theory of indigenous people. So the theory and the discourse that they can produce by themselves. So we are uh, rather we will use um, some theoretical issues from uh, from the West, and uh, not so quite uh, popular use uh, some. I, I even can't imagine uh, some uh, academical or uh, uh, knowledge production from indigenous people. I mean. Uh, okay, um, if we will speak about uh, decolonization or colonization, we will um, quote in uh, the same uh, the same surname, surnames, but maybe we should, uh, from our side, uh, uh, try to find this uh, exactly knowledge from local people. Uh, because uh, we have uh, uh, in the history of ideas a lot of examples of... Um, um, some interesting keys or some interesting researchers uh, who are work uh, who worked uh, in these uh, small local communities uh, in every time I mean in this century or the last century and they worked uh, about this uh, about their ideas and uh, uh, the history like history that uh, wrote from the capital of the city uh, uh, they just uh, exclude these ideas. So, I mean, um, uh, we uh, should f find, uh, we should research uh, these cases uh, about uh, local uh, scientists, uh, local researchers, and trying to include uh, this in the global discourse. But I think that's what uh, Madina from her, uh, uh, from, uh, her studies and her research and Anna are trying to do, but that's a kind of a, from, they, they work from different uh, angle. I guess, uh, Madina, maybe you can um, um, kind of um, elaborate a little bit about on the term uh, indigenous cosmology and... Um, well, I mean, it, I think it's quite clear, no? Uh, I use the term cosmology because I don't like the Western terms that come from Western philosophic uh, traditions. And that's why I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say ontology or epistemology. I sometimes do if I'm dealing with the Western audience, which is ignorant. So you have to explain things, you know, be patient with them. But uh, when we are speaking among ourselves in indigenous communities, then of course we would rather say cosmology because it's a more correct term. As you know from history, from anthropology, uh, these things are not divided in indigenous thinking. Yeah, So it's an idea of the world, but also human being 
as part of it and other beings. So there is no division that I was trying to talk about. Like there's no division into subject and nature or subject and the world out there, right? And that's why the word cosmology may be better uh, fits uh, here. Although, of course, any language is problematic in that sense, right? Uh, any Western language or Russian for that matter would be also problematic uh, because uh, it has a very strong division into subject and object. And so even linguistically, we reinstate that division. Uh, but then there is, as, as uh, Nastya sort of mentioned that in an indirect way, there is always a problem. Like if you are writing in an indigenous language or you're writing using the terms that only indigenous people can understand, then of course you are bound to talk for a, for a very few people, right? So your audience will be very narrow in that sense. And so it's always a choice. Like what do you do about it? Uh, are you loyal to your indigenous community or your village or whatever? And so you, you continue to do it for them or it's more important for you maybe to make your ideas known to the world. And to what extent are you ready to sacrifice your uh, authenticity, whatever we understand that, right? I'm also very skeptical about authenticity. Of course, there is no purity and culture as we know. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, I think it's a dilemma that all artists uh, uh, confront, uh, at least the indigenous ones that I deal with a lot and I write about them. And yeah, very often they ask this question, like they would call and say, you know, my work will be, uh, I mean, some, some, some European museum offered me uh, to buy my work. Uh, sh what should I do? So it's like a fight. I want to be in the, in the European Museum, of course. But on the other hand, I don't want my art to be orientalized and to put there some exotic object, right? So what do you do? What, what is the answer for you? I don't know. <laughs> is it... Is it the answer to uh, uh, to Nastya? Because actually, uh, in addition to what um, uh, to what Madina said, uh, this question, I want to add also a question from the chat uh, about one um, um, uh, one audience. Uh, she's also asking about uh, maybe actually Anna and Nastya can also. Um, come up with some answers. Uh, she's uh, Angelica Do uh, Dalinina. She's saying that art and the uh, building up a successful brand, it's uh, two different things. And um, um, Nastya, what exactly, what kind of, uh, what kind of creative process you're talking about? Uh, I mean, uh, about locality and art that, um, mm, we have a lot of artists, so uh, uh, art is not uh, uh, some uh, sacrificed uh, sphere, it's kind of uh, a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of capitalistic uh, ways of uh, production, production uh, things. Um, and uh, uh, art is, is, uh, exists uh, as other spheres also. And when I uh, said about uh, locality, I mean that uh, uh, so if you just move uh, move to Berlin, where uh, a lot of artists that uh, work um, with um, a lot of interesting global issues, and you uh, want to be something something different from them, so you uh, okay you want to be in the Western Museum, so you want to sell uh, your work and take money from Western uh, countries and. Uh, uh, return back uh, them uh, with, with your uh, to your country uh, and uh, you use your locality it's it's quite kind of problem for me also so how to represent uh, this is this, this locality so i'm from northern uh, uh, north from i'm from north from Arkhangelsk, but i live in st petersburg so i uh, can be uh, the same in the same time St. Petersburg uh, artist and the Arhangelsk artist, it's uh, quite uh, profitable for me. So uh, in the, their cases when some, somebody needs some local artists, it's easy for them to uh, take me, uh, 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 but uh, the right way for them is to go to the northern cities and find uh, artists there. But, but from art, uh, with artists from there, we have a lot of problems uh, because they, uh, I don't know, they uh, may be afraid uh, to be uh, something different. And uh, sometimes uh, they and me also, when I travel through Europe and trying to make exhibition there, I 
this problem of self self colonization i try to be um i try to be uh to be easy i don't know because this problem of non translatable is the same problem like uh uh for problem uh, issues of inclusive inclusive uh inclusive how to be uh, how to be translatable and how to uh, help other persons to understand you it's uh, it's hard and you i don't know try to a lot to make a lot of translations you use your own language you use your i don't know language of your parents uh, other international language and uh, in every time you lose something and this this is a problem I, i don't know how to how to yeah i think so. madina put her life into into trying to find this language especially in the book how to be post soviet yeah. and um, i have a i have a, also a question to madina about the term the uh, community of ch- new communities of change so um uh, can you please maybe i mean you sort of uh, gave us some clues about the features of these new communities of change but can you maybe elaborate a little bit more what what do you mean by that and maybe come up with some examples yeah it's a very good question um it's actually a work in progress uh, i'm i'm writing a, a work now where i elaborate more on that but it's very good that you're asking because it also triggers my thinking uh actually i started uh, from my collaboration with tony fry who is a very famous design theorist from australia and uh, my next book is co-authored with him and it will be out in in two weeks or in three weeks uh and in this book <coughs> we, we reflect on this concept that tony also started working on in his both in his research but also in his uh, activity as a designer uh, a design theorist critical design thinker i would say a philosopher of design so this community of change it's not something authentic it's not an indigenous community in an ethnic sense or ethnic cultural sense it's a mixture it's it's a creolization of many things i would say yeah it's a, because it uh, presupposes of course some local people not necessarily indigenous but maybe some local people who just lived there for four decades uh, or maybe not for decades but for whom this particular space is important uh, also some uh, researchers thinkers uh, activists artists uh designers uh and uh, this community is a very unstable thing it's processual right it's more event like an event uh in uh, in this kind of classical post marxist sense uh and um it's um it meant it's meant to uh deal with particular problems uh for example problems of unsettlement imagine for instance uh, there is a city that needs to be moved because in, in in the coming decades it will be flooded by the ocean right uh and so uh, in uh, this community of change would consist of people who know what can be done in this case like scientists but not only scientists but also local people who've lived there as i said for centuries and for whom a lot more is at stake so it's not like scientists come and tell them what to do uh, but it's more a collaborative process a dialogue uh, and also a, a long set of actions uh, right and uh, we argue also that uh, the university as an institution has to go because it's a very colonial institution and it gives people this detached knowledge that nobody can use and the relational yeah because it's put into this small small disciplines and instead of that it's important to have an hermetic university as tony fry calls it meaning that people who think together they go actually to the place where the problem is and they live there and they communicate and collaborate and then listen to these indigenous people and local people and artists and activists and all stakeholders i hate the word but yes stakeholders to discuss what can be done and decide it together uh so i mean it's not an ethnic community it's a very mixed community of people with different views but people with open uh heads so to say that that are ready to listen to each other and work together and i know that it sounds very utopian <laughs> but i'm afraid that in the future this is what we will 
all have to deal with. I don't believe in the state, any state. I don't believe in political institutions that I think most of them are blessed from the 20th century. They're just not working. And probably this will be the future, that these communities will be surviving on their own, you know, as communities and rebuilding something and uh, redesigning what was designed badly, let's say, like extractivist sites and all of these horrible things that we are left with. You know it very well because the North is a very good example of that, what what you can do bad badly to a na- na- nature, right? Uh, and to humans, of course, and other living beings. Uh, so it's like designing away these signs of modernity and carefully, you know, little by little, trying to find some balance and some kind of survival. Uh, in 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 a, in a sense that it's not only about humans, but it's also about other lives and the planet. Yeah, and I know it sounds utopian, but this is what how I see the future. If you ask me, in hundred years from now. Yeah. Okay. I also uh, wanted to yeah. address one one moment in what Madina said in in continuation what you have just uh, elaborated on community a community of change because I also had a question about them. But, you know, when we were talking about solidarity um, um, and how is it possible to enhance solidarity um, at the backdrop of this growing inequality, something that you also mentioned in your in your presentation, because now we see that uh, equality, um, inequality is growing and we also see that this idea of unsettlement and futurelessness um, exists for some people. And for some people, their life hasn't changed that much. You know, they, they, they are very certain about their future being fine because they feel protected, they feel privileged, they feel uh, very white about themselves. So in that condition, when we see how rapidly we polarize, how the process of solidarity that, it's very, that is very much needed, um, how can we stimulate it? So communities have changed probably one way. Are there other mechanisms for that? Um, yeah, well, community of change is uh, more like an ideal product of what we're we talking about, but we have to do something in order to reach that result, right? Um, well, for me, uh, maybe the most difficult step here for all of us, because we are still living inside modernity, uh, and, and it's very hard to get out of of it, you know, because it's not possible in this world to survive without it. Uh, But at the same time, I think we can start with smaller steps inside these institutions like museums and universities and communities and local communities also, you know, like to to thinking otherwise, uh, thinking together and questioning and destabilizing and infiltrating modernity from inside, from within, let's say, with these little islands of decoloniality. For instance, um, refusing to, uh, you know, to act as rivals to each other, because this is what modernity is grounded in, right? We, it's agonistic. So you have to always compete with, with, with everybody, right? And this is what is ingrained so deeply in our minds. And this is unfortunately also something that prevents the small communities, local or communities of change or any critical communities, let's say, from this solidarity and from these connections, because instead of that, they're competing for some resources, they're competing for some charity, right? And that's why I even use the term like a victimhood rivalry, like who was more victim, you know, and who has more rights to get something, which groups. And this is very unhealthy because it still is in the same logic. Like there is modernity that you cannot question the modern colonial capitalist logic. And then we all come and ask for some little inclusion or whatever. No, I don't want to be included. I want to dismantle the whole system and build a different one rather than, I don't want to be included as an exotic other in this system. Uh, And as long as we continue playing this game, of course, nothing is going to change, right? Uh, I I mean, in my area of, of feminism, I do a lot of, uh, projects uh, based, based, I mean, grounded in this. For example, I said, why do we have to listen always to Western white feminists who will tell us what is meant by feminism? For example, we have socialist and post-socialist women and also feminists and gender studies people there, right? And activists, which is very important. And we have, for example, the third world, the global south today. And both of these groups, they have to communicate through the West, 
They have to have the sanction of the Western uh, feminist, in this case, knowledge. And so the suggestion, why do, no, let's, let's not do it. We, we're not interested in what the West tells us. We can communicate directly and see what we have to say to each other. And the book that uh, will be published soon, actually we, we did it with two other co-editors. Co uh, we decided to not only have mon monologous chapters, but also have conversations and uh, interviews and dialogues. And it's very interesting to read a dialogue, uh, not of Western feminism and some feminism from the global South, but rather of a feminist from, for, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the feminists from former Yugoslavia. You know, they have more things, interesting things to say to each other, uh, rather than always having to deal with the Western appreciation, Western kind of concepts, Western ways of, of looking at the gender problematic or uh, issues. And I think it's true about uh, art as well. Of course, we know that art market is a, is a very rigid thing. So uh, it's true what Nastya said, you have to uh, self-orientalize, uh, I would say, right? So you have to sell yourself as a new post-colonial uh, goods, uh, intellectual or artistic goods in this sense. But you can do it with a tongue in cheek, you know? You can do it ironically. You can do it actually making fun of the whole thing. And that's what many artists do, right? And, uh, and writers, like post-colonial writers. Uh, yeah, they, they, they know that something is always lost in translation. But as Salman Rushdie said 35 years ago, something is also gained in translation. Mm -hmm. And that is an interesting, what is gained? You know, these transcultural things that actually get, they are born as a result of this translations or lack of translations. And I think that uh, as, as somebody who is constantly negotiating this local and global, you have advantages that no Western artists have. You have a, a, a border optic, you know, you can look from different angles on what you're doing. And this is a privilege, actually. Uh, and I think that you have to kind of realize it and then start working with it more in a creative way. Uh, and I, I think it's, uh, this is what we can do. Yeah, we should do. I also yeah, think, uh, yeah, thanks for giving us uh, that kind of um, taught us to be always, to having always tongue in cheek, uh, in cheek. You know, we've kind of grew between layers when we had to sort of pretend and use specific language for a specific situation. So even though sometimes we're maybe sad about this past, it also has taught us lots of tricks that are very applicable to contemporary situation. I see that yes. Katya Sharon would yes. like to join conversation and Akata has a question. Katya, jump in, please, and um, 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 show us your face. And Katya Sharova. Katya, turn on the sound, please. Yes. Uh, do you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We are very happy that everything works finally because we had some technical challenges. Um, but first of all, um, I'm very happy to see here the speakers. I would like to thank you. Um, and uh, it's a fantastic possibility for us at the Arctic Art Forum to collaborate both with talk curators uh, and uh, to have a uh, possibility to join this conversation. Um, I just wanted to comment <clears throat> about this. Uh, I wanted to comment about two things because, of course, we can talk a lot and I will have my own presentation tomorrow um, because many questions which are discussed tonight are, uh, we have been sitting with them for many years. I just wanted to comment on the, what Madina said about the white feminists uh, who is like their agenda and uh, contrasting it with other feminisms. Because um, uh, for, for my practice and my choice of going back to the north and going back to the hometown uh, is a kind of an echo and a result of taking part in a large symposium uh, where I experienced exactly the same. Um, and uh, it was in 2014, and uh, during the first supper symposium, there were Russian feminists uh, and uh, American feminists. And taking part in this, in organizing this, and seeing this invisible threads, because many things are not visible. 
you don't see them, they're not published, they're not translated in the media. Uh, the way how the media translated all these stories is completely different because they are unknowledgeable, they know nothing about Northern Russia or even the North in general. And uh, also uh, I found it interesting how the American feminist artists were talking to the Russian artists. And it was more like a peer and a student position. And I found it very challenging. So, but since then, um, this is another thing I wanted to comment um, about Anastasia because she said that she can hardly imagine any indigenous theories. <clears throat> Having worked in the North for six years now, uh, we have met lots of indigenous theories, especially, but mostly in the Nordic countries. Uh, and uh, last year, the Arctic Art Summit, uh, we um, have been, I was moderating a panel with Gut Gunvor Gutorm, uh, who is a PhD in Sami, she's a PhD in Duoji. Duoji is a Sami handicrafts. Uh, but here we have completely different story. We have a completely different context and we know that for two days ago, uh, the Office of Contemporary Art ex exporting artists to the Venice Biennale, they selected Sami artists. So we have theory, we have art critics, we have infrastructure, but it's a completely different context. When I was invited uh, as, a, an, as an advisor for an indigenous quintinale in the National Gallery of Canada, uh, I was facing lots of challenges because in Russia we have a completely different situation, uh, like Anastasia named now, when we start thinking, okay, who are our indigenous artists? Contemporary indigenous artists, what is contemporary indigenous art? Can I take an artist from Dagestan and call them indigenous? It's like, uh, we don't have any theory, we don't have infrastructure. And I think that this symposium and this panel is a fantastic possibility to discuss this. Um, I think I will stop here and maybe continue um, tomorrow. But thank you very much for, for, for your comments. I just really enjoy after all the technical stuff was <laughs> solved. So <laughs> thank you very much. I have a question actually, it's a, it's a complex one, but I'm also preoccupied uh, with this. And also like it's very directly connected into the idea of interdependency. Uh, interdependency in relation to uh, ecological and political agenda. So um, you kind of people of hybrid identity as us, so you understand like post-Soviet context, you understand Western context. So in relation to nature, as Medina said, uh, uh, there are like, uh, in the Western countries, there is a very much um, uh, agenda of saving nature for the future use is happening. So while in post-Russian context, in relation to natural resources, we're not even there. There is some ecological optimism going on within like some, um, um, uh, with some ecological activist communities, it's clear that totally different discourses or not discourses is happening within this corporate uh, uh, subculture. And um, uh, so my question is, uh, or rather, rather uh, invitation to think together is, um, um, uh, so I'm kind of, I kind of lost, uh, lost, uh, uh, give me, give me a second, uh, what I was, uh, what I was trying to, um, uh, 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 to say. So basically, yes, so there is no um, even understanding uh, about uh, this idea of saving nature, because uh, we have a lot of this uh, uh, in, uh, in Russia, and there is a, um, and it's always like uh, there is no end of this somehow. There is no end of resources. And that's, I guess, also traveling the tradition of uh, lack of critical discourse, uh, critical ecological discourse is traveling for so uh, from Soviet time when it was actually no a framework for alternative ecological discourse because it was very much suppressed. And um, uh, what is happening now is also 
some sort of um, uh, lack of um, understanding uh, on the, on the, I guess, uh, on the uh, on the uh, level of policy and uh, level of um, uh, politics and that level of uh, uh, economy. There is still this lack of understanding that resources um, uh, have end. Uh, and um, uh, that's um, so. I'm just wondering, like, what is your, uh, what do you think could could change this chain of of thinking, and how to explain this post-Soviet ecological conditions to in the region or to the to the neighboring countries, like to sort of uh, describe the um, um, ecological, uh, a complex ecological agenda of Russia to within the region. But I don't think it's lack of knowledge. I think it's simply neglect and indifference and carelessness and just, you know, caring about very small privileged uh, political elite, but uh, in certain parts of geography, but not giving a shit about other um, parts of the country that are very resourceful. And we spoke a lot about it with Katya and Christina. And you, of course, when we're planning the symposium forum, how the North is being this resource and this kind of, you know, peripheral um, territory that's only supplies, but never receives anything back and is being used for, for ages as, you know, supply of timber and anything. And this big case with cheese is an example of, of this policy that is based on, on neglect and I think um, uh, confidence. And, and, um, and here we kind of, you know, put it, the entire conversation into political dimension. So I, I don't have a question, an answer about how-, how I'm just wondering to think yeah. together, like where this chain of thought starts really, because we all know this, uh, like this very traditional culture in different parts of Russia, very close to earth. It's very kind of deeply rooted also to the region. Like, uh, like Anna explained, there is like um, a deep tradition in relation to culture and, uh, and nature. There is kind of no separation really. So, like, um, uh, do you think that in Soviet time this tradition was totally break? Uh, people were forced to move from their land and relocate, and then they lost relation to 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 their uh, to nature, to what they have to take care uh, uh, for. Or um, um, I don't know. Enlighten me in this. I guess I I maybe need more uh, insight from you guys. Uh, uh, I also have several uh, comments to make, both uh, about the questions that uh, were given to Anastasia and then also uh, about your question. But I will start from your question. I think uh, it's not uh, very much about the physical unsettlement or physical displacement, but a lot about the cultural displacement and unsettlement, because in the Soviet time, the people framed themselves more in the broader na national discourse of understanding standing economical relations and uh, especially uh, if you if you look at the uh, the areas that were traditionally Russian and didn't have any kind of alternative ethnic identity that could be used as uh, kind of a, a, additional to understanding the locality and sustainability and so on so as a result now we see the the areas like the area where I live uh, when I am on my vacation in in the village where people are settled culturally when they look at the um, modern surroundings with the modern buildings built in the 70s of the Soviet Union as something which is um, victimizing them. But in the 70s, then they all wanted to move into the new buildings from the old Russian wooden houses. They understood this as something like a privilege for them to be part of the modern development of their villages. So this set unsettlement is a process that uh, actually it's a term which I really liked a lot uh, from the Madiner's uh, talk uh, because it, it should be studied from the point of view of the process. And then I can think about the case that demonstrates the new community building in the northern villages and people are uh, involved in the processes of reconstruction 
construction of the wooden uh, monuments like wooden churches, chapels, houses. And this is a really interesting process to look after because artists and people from outside, like researchers, are usually starting this project. And then there are some community members who would like to participate. And then also a lot of community members who are for a long time ignorant about that. Uh, but then uh, the process starts uh, as a community process and it's it's more kind of an artistic process than a religious or any kind of ideological thing. And if you look at the way how uh, the small steps of development of heritage, of new heritage understanding as, as a starting for the narrative or community narrative. If you look at that, you can you can trace some of the things uh, that could be understandable as a new community building. So I, I see processes like that in different villages in the north, and uh, they are also well developed into the art objects sometimes, like in Rovdina Gara in Halmagorsky region, and then also, uh, as I said, in Magian Dom in uh, in the Chakala village in Piniga. So uh, the 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 concept of community communities of change can be applied to this process. So uh, if you ask about the art as uh, the brand maker, then um, I think about uh, the two levels of understanding that in the contemporary Russian context where I live. Well, well first is a kind of opposing the local voice of an artist to the mass production. Uh, like a lot of uh, cultural objects in the modern localities in, in, in the Arhangisk region are produced as, as a mass production, all these billboards and then also a lot of different um, uh, things that are manufactured mass in the Soviet context and in the modern uh, big enterprises. So in, in this way, uh, there could be a local voice that w that is built on the heritage tradition, opposed to the mass-produced brands and heard by the uh, local people. But then also there is a second, more international level uh, when you need to say something as local in the in the multiple voices and the polyphony of voices. And here is a challenge, of course, because you cannot use the universal language because it kind of is producing authenticity, as I said, from the point of view of the Western discourse. But then you also need to tell something that could be translatable, that could be understood, as, as Anastasia said, by the other people. And uh, that, but but that's, that's not only the challenge, that's a really good thing to study and to start, because this way you can, you can say something new about you and then about the way how you live. And uh, the process of uh, artistic creation is very important thing here. If, if you somehow, uh, as Anastasia does and as artist, <laughs> if you somehow may introduce the people from outside into the process and kind of show how you work with these artifacts in, in your artistic reality, that helps, I think, to understand uh, the way how you are rooted, embedded in the locality and how you use the, the local languages. But you also have to be aware of the uh, kind of, uh, of the, these universe, universal languages <laughs> that are highly used in the modern discourse and that are, of course, uh, colonizing uh, the local knowledge a lot. So, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to tell, first of all. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Does anyone have any more uh, comments or, or questions or reflections on what has been said so far? Yeah, well, the reason why I was asking this question, I was just, you know, like, uh, since we talk about interdependency, I think Russian region or post-Soviet region, it is so important uh, uh, a player uh, uh, when it comes to natural resources, right? It also supplies lots of uh, regions around. And uh, so in order to understand how things are working, uh, what is the um, ecological studies of post-Soviet Russia? What are the... Um, um, not outspoken uh, maybe features of ecological subculture. And uh, I think it's very important also maybe to translate wider. And I'm also like in the process of um, understanding it, like uh, uh, the... Um, the relation of um, uh, the relation of uh, 
uh, not only like local communities, but also the mentality of uh, of government and uh, and corporation towards this. Uh, uh, some sort of instinct in uh, nature and this efficiency in this uh, in this business. So I think this is like very complex processes which we I guess try to unpack within uh, within uh, our symposium as well. Hopefully, like we um, uh, we compose some sort of uh, maybe new new information for our audience uh, for our potential uh, or audience who are going to listen the. Uh, 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 the recordings of our conversations. Maybe some closing notes from guys, from you. Medina, Anna, Nastya. But I, I kind of, I'm very inspired with this imperative um, uh, presentation by Medina and the community of, of change, uh, this kind of, uh, um, agents of, of change, um, and I, I'm, I, I want to believe in this concept. I like it, and I think that um, there are already a lot of people who are promoting change on, on maybe their local level, and, and I think uh, the forum is, is, a, is a part of this community change movement in a way, in a way by uh, producing this new knowledge and pushing this new knowledge and pushing the, the borders of um, this Nordic discourse and raising all of these important um, issues and, and kind of uh, unpacking this, this narratives that also have been repressed for years. So um, I, in, 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 in um, kind of thinking of interdependency, I also think that it's very important to learn from each other in this knowledge, knowledge exchange and this experience exchange and this um, not rejection, but, you know, challenging the Western lands, I think will be very, very useful because sometimes we don't really <clears throat> reflect that much upon how much it's embedded, embedded in, in our vision, how we are very much connected to uh, looking at it, um, looking through it at the world. So kind of decolonizing oneself would also be a very important process to, to practice on a regular basis in order to uh, kind of stimulate um, this growing of community of change. I don't know, it's, it's a very kind of, uh, you know, path as uh, speed, but I, I think the, this year has um, contributed to, to us using lots of uh, path as words in a way. So um, thank you everyone for joining tonight. And I, I, I'm, I'm very happy with how we opened despite all the technicals, technical uh, difficulties that we had in the beginning and let's continue tomorrow. And tomorrow we're gonna be talking about um, political aspects of, of the Arctic. So I think something also very important to, to discuss in terms of ecological and political imaginary. Yeah, we have two two parts of the panel is going to be very much about shared for, forecast. We're going to be thinking and challenging notion of um, uh, different borders, uh, geographical, mental, uh, dis disciplinary. Uh, and in the second half, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to take a step back in a way in history and uh, look about suppressed um, uh, historical ecological narrative and uh, how to how to um, uh, about uh, he, uh, ecological disasters in the past, how to learn from that, and if it a, any uh, possibility actually that it could lead us to thinking about rethinking um, uh, about our actions in the future. So please join everyone and uh, I also say that to the audience which is with us now on uh, different uh, YouTube channels. So we're not saying goodbye, but we say until tomorrow. Thank you very much everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.